Dr. John, welcome to Dad Edge, man. What's up, Larry? How we doing, brother? Uh, I'm doing great, man. Has anyone has anyone ever told you that you have like this contagious energy about you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been told, uh, man, you're a lot, and you should probably take about thirty percent off. I've been told that a lot most of my life, but nobody's ever told me, man. We're really glad you bought uh, <laughs> brought a live taser into our meeting. So thank you. Man. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know, I, I'd much rather have that than, you know, you know, dead air or somebody who's not energized to be here. And yeah, but we all know that we all know that person that's like a walking Xanax. It's kind of cool to be around because they just kind of bring the room down a little bit. But yeah, I, I'm, I'm a lot. I can be a lot. That's OK. That's OK. It, it adds some flair. Um, I got to tell you, this was years ago. I used to have this coaching client. I worked with him for about six months and did pretty well. Uh, but he was one of those coaching clients that I mean, I've learned this here in the past few years that be very choosy about who you actually take on as clients. Right. Mm -hmm. And this guy, like literally his nickname amongst our leadership team was Eeyore. Oh, and yep. it was like, I had to like literally gear myself up, like to yeah. just be on coaching calls with them, but yep. uh, it was tough, but we mm -hmm. had some breakthroughs. So that was good. There you go. Very yeah. cool, man. Very cool. Well, my man, I'm excited to have you on and uh, really excited about today's podcast. And before we jump into your book, what I'm always so just eager to learn more about is, is your childhood, how you grew up. It's, it's just a telling way of like how people got from point A to B. And, and I'd also love for you to include just what your relationship was like, even with your own dad growing up, since this is a dad show. Yeah. So um, I grew up in Houston and my dad was a homicide detective and a SWAT hostage negotiator. So no he was a bad dude. And um, uh, so I grew up with this, really with this picture of when things are on fire, when there's bullets flying or whatever, your job. And again, he never told me this. This was just yeah. the, you just watch your, you know, you kind of do what your parents do. Um, that you go in, you head in. Um, when things get messy, you're supposed to go into that. Um, and not go out. So I've got some very vivid pictures in my head of, you know, him putting on his bulletproof vest at seven at night and heading into a hostage scene or to a, you know, somebody had a bomb or gun or something. And that's just his job. That's what he would do. And um, then my mom was, she came from a faith culture that she wasn't allowed to go to college. Um, she was not supposed to go. Women had one job and that was to stay at home and raise family. And so she got married out of, she graduated high school and then was just working. And then when she met my dad and um, at the age of 42, I think 41 or 42, she was working like in the craft room at like a local church. And she ended up taking one community college class. My dad had been asking her to do, I mean, everybody supported her, but she still had that, what I, that cultural hangover that says, you're not enough. You're not, you can't do this. She took one community college class. And then the next semester, she was very successful. She took another class the next semester and then another one the next semester. And so fast forward to 57, she graduates from a research one university with her PhD. And then she starts a whole second life as a professor. And so she had a lot of stuff in her, you know, in her childhood growing up. My dad did too. And then that's, that's the cool part of the story. The hard parts, man, is growing up with the homicide detective. Um, he has a very skewed way of seeing the world. And so yeah. I was hard and I had my own childhood trauma stuff. I had my own mess growing up. Um, I, I just won the lottery with my parents. I and mean, we just celebrated their 50th anniversary. I mean, they're really extraordinary people. Wow. And man, we had some hard, hard stuff. And there was a couple of years we didn't talk very much or, at all. And I mean, it was, there was some st hard stuff. And so, um, I don't know. Uh, I don't know anybody that doesn't have stuff at home, depending on how you know how big or how small it is. But um, yeah, it was. It was. I wouldn't change my childhood for anything. Grew up on a pretty remarkable little street that I look back on it and think, yeah, that's probably why I've been to a lot of therapy and um, had some great adventures. And some of those those um, little boys have grown up to be men that are still in my life to this day. So um, it's a pretty remarkable, adventurous childhood. Man, there's so many different ways I could go here. I, I have I have two questions, so I'm gonna I'm gonna ask both, but I would I'm really curious about the first one. But so my first question is this: being raised by a man who is a hostage negotiator, number one, I can only imagine the things that you could never get away with. So I'm I really oh, want to know what what was it like, you know, growing up with 
a man who probably knew every bit of bad that you were going to do before you even did it. So that's like question number one, and maybe some lessons of what that was like, but also, I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't think we ever really grow up, you know, no matter how long our parents are together or, or whether we come from a broken home or whatever it is, there's always just this mixture of really good things, really tough things, a lot of adversity, maybe even some wounds and some trauma and some amazing things. But I would really love to know the second question is, 50 years of marriage. Like you never hear that anymore. And yeah. you know what that looked like, but as far as how have you taken maybe some of the good life lessons as it pertains to marriage and incorporate those in your life. But like I said, I'd love for you to answer question number one first, which was being raised by a hostage negotiator and, and trying to get away with maybe even anything that you probably couldn't. Yeah. Um, man, it, to be honest with you, it was brutal. It was tough. Um, not to mention he was, I mean, we lived in a small community that it's since exploded. And it's a, it's basically a, a big city outside of Houston now, but at the time it was a very small, tight knit community. And so he was the guy that my, you know, I was a teenager that the parents in the community would reach out to, to show up to their house in the middle of the night. And which was great and good, but he knew stuff about my friends that dads aren't supposed to know, you know what I mean? And so I might say, Hey, I'm going to go hang out with so-and-so. And he'd say, no, nah, you're not. And man, I'd get so mad and try to talk around it. And you're right. He knew. And um, so here's what happened. I ultimately adapted, evolved, if you will. I was a, I was a, a resistant strain of bacteria. I turned into a world-class liar. I could get away with anything. Even, and, like, even with him. Well, if you can beat a SWAT hostage negotiator, you can beat yeah, anybody. Right? Beat anybody. And um, I... I spent years um, of my childhood um, not telling the truth, just made up stuff. I wanted to be loved. And, and, and I think my, my dad and I have hugged front hugged like three times in my whole life ever, like a uh. shared a deep hug. And so this wasn't his language and he didn't have, I mean, he didn't, that's not, that's not a picture he had growing up. And so um, I was, I was screaming for a connection. And the way I would do that was to have sensational stories and to have sensational excuses. And Hey, guess what about this? What about this? And, what sucks about that is I was a um, man. I was a, I had I had everything. I had good grades and I was a good athlete and I had a rock and roll band that was really was, was a pretty big deal and um, none of it was enough. I always had to push that envelope and make sure people thought a little bit more highly of me than was really truthful. And so uh, it ended up being when uh, I had a ringside seat in my first professional jobs. I watched a couple of senior execs just implode their careers by not telling the truth. And it was a big never again. And so now I've become pathological the other way um, to where I've got to be careful when somebody says, Hey, do I look good in this? I got to take a beat before I'm like, Nope, <laughs> never wear that again. So I got to be a little more careful, but um, yeah, it was hard. It was frustrating, right? When you're a kid, you want to, you, you, the kids are designed man, to, to hit their heads up against boundaries and see if they hold. And yeah, when you're when your father's a hostage negotiator and a homicide detective, that boundaries can sometimes be iron, right? Mm -hmm. And they're they're not as elastic, not as soft. Um, second question. What was your second question? Second question. So first of all, just some quick reflections. Um, yeah. Gosh, man, I think really what you touched on there was, you know, a kid's deep core need to be, hey, am I enough? Yeah. Right. And, and I've and I've learned through through whether it's from my own kids through walking alongside countless kids over the last 20 years or academic training, kids most often learn that they are enough by being held, by being touched. And that is a part of our culture. We have just completely sucked out of society. And we like to talk a lot to our kids. We like to educate our kids and show them things and hand them digital babysitters that will reinforce things. We just don't touch our kids very often. Uh, after they get to be a certain age, especially little boys, mm -hmm. especially, especially dads and little boys. And um, so it is a become a mission. I told my son early on, you're gonna have to just get over it, son, because your dad's gonna hug you, your dad's gonna kiss you, dad's gonna touch you on the face. And obviously, I'm not gonna violate his, his body, right? So he's if he says, Dad, please stop touching, I'm gonna honor that. But um, I told him, man, I'm gonna hug you at, on the field in front of your buddies. So just get over that. And there's that in initial, <gasps> And then you can just feel him. he's huge. He's a freak of nature. Our whole family's humongous, but um, you can feel a melt. He just kind of comes unglued a little bit. His body relaxes. And um, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I think that's how you, you can 
teach kids, if you will, you can communicate with kids that they're loved and they have value and they're worth something is by the skin on skin contact. I tell people to touch their kid's face every day. Um, it has a, it has a, a uh, sedative effect on a small child. It'll just bring them, it'll slow them down. Um, there's so many nerve endings on the human face. And then as they get older, continue to touch them on the face or on the back of the neck. And they just tend to bring everything down. It's a gift. Man, you mind if, mind if I share something with you real quick? It's pretty personal. Yeah, go for it, brother. So I, I have four boys. I have a uh, almost 16-year-old, 14-year-old, uh, eight-year-old, six-year-old. My, my house is like a fraternity house that never sleeps. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, the, the, the tile around your toilet seat has got to be just unbelievable. <laughs> I mean, we might as well just get green tile at this point, man. It just goes everywhere. Just cement, man. I'm just, I'm not even kidding. Like this kind of a, it's, this is actually true. I've actually have said this in my home within the past two weeks. I'm like, how do you get pee on the shower curtain? It's like two feet away from the, but no kidding around. I don't know how, but yeah. So, um, my 14 year old, he is, um, he's kind of stoic, you know, and he, he's built well, he's a football player. He's kind of like one of those kids. He's, he's a, he's like cool dude. Right. Yeah. And my older one, is very affectionate. Well, so is my 14 year old, but here's the, here's the interesting thing about the danger in, in us as dads and parents, like labeling your kids, like, Oh, they're that way. So then they're, that's how I operate. And I asked my son, I'm really always into these, what what we call generative questions. Well, it's actually kind of like, uh, questions for humans. Oh, look at you, man. Look at you. Yeah. (laughs) But uh, I love asking my kids deep questions. And I, I ask my, my kids, like, what, what's one, two or three things that I do that make you feel most loved by me? Mm-hmm. And I asked my 14-year-old that. And he, his response was, hug me, hug me, hug me. And I was like, I'm, I'm sorry, what? And he goes, and he's always hugging my wife, always, like always, always wants affection from her. And I was like, are, are you serious? And he said, yeah. He goes, to be honest, like, I, this might be hard for you to hear, but I wish you were more affectionate with me. I'm like, wow. I was like, really? He's like, yeah. He goes, because he goes, um, you know, you hug me, but I, I, I would love for you to hug me more. I was like, wow, man. I was like, it, it just, it, man, it hit me in the heart. And I was yeah. like, I was like, you know what? I was like that I needed to hear that. And I was like, because to be honest, man, like I view you as like this strong, stoic, tough guy, football player who probably doesn't want to be hugged by his old man. Mm-hmm. And I was like, literally that's, those are the things I say to myself. And I was yep. like, and my gosh, like how untrue is that? You just basically told me that what I'm telling myself is a complete story that I have made up. That's not true. He's like, yeah, don't, no, I, I really want you to hug me more. I'm like, man. Mm-hmm. So I'm so glad you said that because that's more awesome, dads man. need to hear that. Well, and I, man, I can get, I can get pretty weepy pretty fast. The fact that your 14 year old can articulate that and feel safe enough to tell his old man that put you in rare, rare air, my brother. Um, that means you, that's, that is years of teaching a kid what feelings are and how to speak and how to be heard and that you're a safe place for him to say hard things. Um, most young boys could not say what your son said to their dad. So good for you, man. That's awesome. Thank you, man. I, I take the, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Uh, yeah. And, and so going back to the second question, there's not many people that I don't think any of us know that have been married for 50 plus years. Mm. And, you know, I'm sure everything was in sunshine, rainbows and unicorns, you know, throughout <laughs> the years, there are seasons, nope. there are years that are tough that sometimes there's a decade or two that's tough, yeah. but growing up with that, what's maybe one, two or three things that you've taken from the longevity of that relationship and seeing it and bringing it into your own marriage. So we have just abused, we've beaten up, our parents' generation and the one right above them when it comes to marriage. We always are running our mouths about the the divorce rates and the this. Here's what they went. Their parents came home from World War II, either not alive or they just left the depression and then they went and shot at people. Then they came home and they hid all of that because there was no language about trauma or about mental health, none of that stuff. They had one avenue, which was go to work. And to maybe get plugged in in a local church or maybe get plugged in a local softball, go to work, shut your mouth and get to work, go build this country. And so then our parents' generation comes along and that's the picture they had. And think about this. My parents, I think, were married in 1970. 
It wasn't until 1973 that a woman was allowed to go to the bank and get a checking account without her husband's signature. That's the law. So if you think about in my house, my, the house that I grew up in, the man, the, the man and woman who got married, my mom had to go through my dad to get a checking account. My mom had to go through my dad to start a local small sewing business that she had. My dad had to sign the mortgage. My mom couldn't buy a car. This was federal law. And then you see a shift that happens 20, 30 years later when my mom, my dad is a quit being a police officer about halfway through my childhood and became, uh, he was always volunteering with youth programs and he became a minister at a large church working with youth. And so, yeah, you want to talk about trauma. I had a cop and a minister for a dad. You can leave that, that one to the, that one to the psychologist. A man. That's a combination. <laughs> um, but you have a guy who's got a bachelor's degree whose wife goes through essentially the feminist revolution, learning that she has a voice in the 90s, right? Because she missed all this because she wasn't allowed to go to school in the 60s and 70s when women learned that their voice mattered. She's reading things and having learning opinions and learning her own thoughts on things. And then she ends up with a PhD. So we're talking about an entire shift in voice, an entire shift in power, an entire shift in how the relationships operate and manage. And so there's no one, and they had no structure for this. Nobody sat down with the men and said, hey, you've been told that things are the way, the way they always are going to be. The things have changed. And nobody sat down with the women and said, hey, you're being told right now that you don't need anybody. You're all that matters. That's not true. You actually need other people in relationships. And hey, by the way, men, you need relationships too. Nobody told them anything. They just said, go figure it out. And by the way, um, in this 50-year arc, um, sexuality becomes mainstream. So you got to be attractive. You always have to be good looking and you have to be super smoking, good looking into your seventies and eighties and stay sexually active. And by the way, we're going to quit going to church. So you have to answer all my existential questions too. And Oh, by the way, um, you got to keep me safe. And by the way, I'm we're both working. Um, and so we're going to have different relationships. Outside. So you see what I'm saying? It was a mess. And so to blame that group of that band of human who had no models, no instructions, and people just lobbing grenades at them. I have a lot of empathy for, for folks who tried to help hold it together. And then I look at my folks and say, the, the fact that you made it 50 years is lesson number one, that you never give up. You never give up. You keep walking that line. You keep, as long as you're safe, you keep walking that line and keep walking that line. The second important thing is, is over time roles shift. And you always have to balance the roles that you play inside your relationship with the broader cultural roles. And more importantly, you and your spouse, you and your partner have to talk about the roles that best meet the needs of your relationship, not each other, the relationship in this particular season. And those seasons change. When you have a bunch of little kids running around, everything's chaos. And so we have different roles. When you have two teenage kids or you two empty nesters, you have no kids, the roles are different. So you got to keep talking about it and keep shifting. And so I learned that from my parents who had to, man, they were changing the oil on that car while it was driving, right? And then the third thing is, is probably forgiveness. And uh, I've watched my parents do things that, that hurt each other, that hurt other people. And they've had to forgive and show up and be angry and come back to the table and come back to the table. That idea that forgiveness, a, a decision to not forgive, and we've heard this a million times is, like me poisoning myself, hoping somebody else will die, um, bringing my resentment, bringing my lack of willingness to forgive back to the table simply just destroys my relationship. It sets me on fire. There's no reason to do it. And so the only way forward often is to say, I'm sorry, to be humble, to, to ask for forgiveness, and then be about what comes next. So those are a couple of three things that I've took, watched it just being a part of their relationship and um, now being in my own relationship, watching it from afar. There was gold there. And, you know, before we dive into your book, I want to hit one big lesson that you nailed there that I think a lot of couples, a lot of married couples, we, we tend to avoid the topic and for mm -hmm. several different reasons why I think, you know, things I've heard from other, from other guests on the show. And I, what I'm talking about is roles, right? Mm -hmm. What do you do? What do I do? What do we do together? Yeah, and what do we own and not necessarily possessions, but what do we own is our role. And I think a lot of us don't, don't know how to broach that topic. We don't know what it looks like. We don't communicate about it. And then what happens is, is if we don't know, we tend to expect, we have these expectations of each other 
And some, and a lot of times they're silent expectations that's and right. then they're not communicated. And then what happens is when people aren't meeting our expectations, that's when emotional resentment builds. And then that's like this dividing wall between our, our communication further on and then intimacy and all these other things. But how have you incorporated, you know, that conversation of, of roles in, in your own marriage? Well, one, I got, I mean, I've almost blown it up a few times. And so some of it was just preservation. If we don't have this conversation, this thing doesn't last. Right. Um, and a lot of the roles begin with these stories we're born into, right. We're born into a house or we're adopted into a home that this is just what the dad does. And this is what, you know, mom does, or if there's two dads, whatever, this is just what family looks like. And so I live into one of those and that just becomes the way things quote unquote are. That's all I know. The challenge is my wife grew up with a similar picture, right? So a good example is her dad um, would come home on Sundays and there was, you know, um, everybody just kind of knew you let dad do his thing on Sundays. I, I liked on Sundays, man, I want to hang out with everybody. Let's be loud and silly. And she had it wired into her that you leave dad alone on Sunday. Well, I took that as rejection. I took that as what's so bad about me, man? Why don't you want to hang out? And it's like, well, I want to do this. But, and so over time, like you mentioned, it, that little gap of, well, fine then, well, fine then, turns into this big gap, right? And so that's number one is recognizing without just frank conversations about who's owning what, um, this thing's not going to make it. I, I just don't think it's going to make it. Or you're going to end up being roommates. And how many people do we know are married? And they're just roommates, man. They're just co-managing yeah. their house. They've stopped sleeping together. They've stopped laughing together. They've stopped finding each other curious and adventurous and fun. It's just, they're just done with that. So the second part is this. We don't want to talk about roles because we want to have one conversation and be done with it. And roles shift a mm -hmm. lot over time. Um, man, some seasons, one of you has to, is curled up with grief and is dealing with trauma from their childhood. One of you is um, just because you've got different biology than me and you got different body parts. So some of the kid stuff's going to fall on you. So I've got to circle back and really pick up the other load over here. Right. So some of it is just seasonal and we don't, we want to have one hard conversation forever and never touch it again. And man, it life is about seasons. And so when you have the roles conversation, you're going to have it over and over and over again. And instead of dreading it, it can be a really incredible part of your relationship to say, all right, where are we now? What season are we in now? What can I do to make meet your needs so that it frees you up to help meet my needs? And man, if you go about a relationship that way, dude, that's pretty remarkable. It is. And I, I love how you talked about how these roles are dynamic and they're ever changing. You know, I just had a podcast guest on to talk about, uh, talk about sex with kids, pornography, like all those things that kids are confronted with, especially with devices. That was one of the biggest things that just was said over and over and over again. Don't ever think that these conversations are one and done. You know, don't ever think, you know, they, they, these are ongoing conversations that need to be had over and over again, just to make sure that we're checking in that, you know, that I'm doing my part, you're doing your part. Like the, these, and that's, that's refreshing because I agree with you. A lot of us think, uh, that it, these are one and done it, some interesting statistics though. I don't know if you've ever heard this. This actually was in the, the miracle morning for couples. They did some research. So everybody knows the divorce rates 50%, but, uh, basically adding to what it is that you just said, which is the roommate thing. We live under the same roof as strangers. So a lot of people don't know this. I quote this on the podcast a lot though. So the audience might be sick of it, but the 50% that stay together, they're actually divided up equally into three camps, like one third, one third, one third, one third of couples who stay married can actually identify their relationship. Hey, it's working. It's working. It's, it's good. We're, we're doing things right. Uh, the second camp is, it's all right. It's just, you know, I'm kind of settled. It's, it's not horrible. Um, it's what it is. Yep. It's what it is. I'm not going anywhere. And then the third camp is like, we, there's no connection. We're, we're basically strangers living underneath the same house. And the two reasons they don't get divorced is either it's too financially devastating or they have this perception of we have to stay together for the kids, but once they're out of here, we're done. Yep. So, and that's sad, but that that's refreshing. Thanks for, thanks for sharing what you did. You bet. Um, I would love, so let's, let's move into your book. Okay. The first three words, own your past. 
right? <laughs> change your future, own your past, change your future, but own your past. Like that can just those three words alone can just rattle people, right? Yeah. That thinking back to all oh, the things I've done, the good, the bad, you know, owning it. But why is it so difficult for just human beings in general to own their past or even, you know, even taking that a step deeper is, you know, even forgiving themselves for some of the missteps and some of the things that they've said or done or, you know, decisions they've made. Yeah. Um, man, I think when it comes to ownership, so much of our culture is about shame. Oh. And that that ownership is twofold. I got to own the stuff that I've done, the stupid things I've said, the times I've hurt people. But I also have to own what was done to me. And I don't want to think about that. I don't want to say it out loud. I've got physiological mechanisms that help wall that off for me. It makes me die younger, but it gets me through today and then it gets me to tomorrow and it gets me to the next day. And so I've got to own the whole story. And the reality is our bodies will continue to fight or run or go numb, or it will continue to fight and try to survive on our behalf for things that happened 20 years ago, 30 years ago, two years ago, 10 minutes ago, if we don't bring our stories into the present. That's what ownership is. It's saying, here is reality right now. And when our brains recognize we're in the right now, it can start to heal. It can start to calm down. Because it remembers what happened and it begins to scan the environment so that never happens again. And then when you say, hey, 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 that did happen. There was an active shooter there. I was assaulted here. This happened, but I'm okay now. Now your body can go, and now we can be about healing and about what comes next. But we live in a culture that if something happened to you when you were a young child, it was probably your fault. When dad screamed, you sh I mean, it's your job to make sure the adults in your life are not emotionally reactive. Um, oh, you were 17 and some school admissions counselor told you you need to take out $100,000 in student loans or you're going to be a failure and a loser and no one would date you and you're going to get crappy jobs. <laughs> I'm, am I going to dump that on you, the 17-year-old who has a society we won't even let you buy cigarettes, but we'll let you take out a $100,000 loan? I mean, it's madness. And so we have to take ownership of our story. I just got to hold it. And man, most of us, that story hurts. The story yes. hurts, but we got to own it. Um, if you don't ever get to the root infection and surgery, you can dig some of that stuff out of there. You can continue to change the dressing. That infection is going to slowly kill you over time. You got to get in there and, and deal with it. What do you think? I want to go deeper on that. What do you think is the first step in getting through that shame? Hmm. <sighs> Um, getting rid of secrets, mm. speaking it out loud. The, the only path I've ever seen, whether in the research data or in real life, um, the only path through shame is speaking it out loud. That's all I've ever seen. Uh, I think it's Brene Brown that says shame eats secrets for breakfast. And I yeah. think that's, that's accurate. Um, there's something about speak. Every major religion has confession, has speaking as a part of their, um, healing, you know, their cyclical healing cycle. Um, Every great therapy is about saying it out loud. And there's something that takes the air out of that evil that's, that's wind. And I don't mean woo-woo evil. I mean the cortisol and the adrenaline and the nonstop um, gut biome issues, all the stuff that comes from our body that is constantly in fight or flight. Um, I think there's something just, I, I wish I could point my finger on it physiologically, but the just healing just to speak it out loud. That's step one to, to get into the shame. That's actually step two. Step one is having someone to say it to. And we live such isolated, lonely, exhausted lives that we have nobody. And um, we lob grenades on the internet or we will like vomit on the internet. Um, there's actually some research that says, man, if you it, text with a, a, a mental health therapist, the first few sessions feel really powerful because someone will vomit stuff electronically because they're not in the room. Um, but the relationship dies pretty quickly thereafter. There's not a lot of long-term. So you got to have people in your life and that you can speak openly to, whether it's a professional or a group or a gang or a men's group or a women's group or whatever. And then you have to be heard. You have to be fully known and fully loved at the same time. And that's shame can't survive in that kind of ecosystem. Do you think shame has become more powerful now that we have social media? Oh my gosh. 
that and we live in a world where if you speak out loud things that happened to you in the past, that is your new identity for the rest of your life. That's all you'll ever be is the worst thing that happened to you. All you'll ever be is the abuse, the trauma, the crap that happened to you. All you'll ever be is what you did that time, right? That old saying, you can build a thousand bridges and you cheat once and you're a cheater. That's who you are. That's what you'll always be. Um, you'll always be a cancer survivor. You'll always be limited by, you'll always be labeled by the worst stuff that ever happened to you. That's our, that's our culture right now. And there is no redemption story. There's just burn it to the ground. And then you dump on top of that. that nobody hangs out with other people, right? Um, there's no safety. Our bodies recognize we're alone. We're isolated. I got 2000 friends on the internet, but I don't have anybody to help change a tire in my driveway. I got nobody to help um, with move a couch in my living room. Our bodies recognize that, right? It's, it's keeping track of all that stuff. And so, man, you, com- you, you pile those two things on top of each other and it's a recipe for a culture that's just imploding on itself. Yeah, you, you alluded to it earlier, but you know, in your first chapter, you know, you talk about these, the, the five steps, which is own stories, acknowledge reality, get connected, change your thoughts and change your actions. I want to dive just a little bit deeper on the get connected part because um, community and especially now that everything is virtual online, which I think you can get some of that. But one of the things that we hear constantly, especially with men, and there's obviously a huge audience of men who listen to this show, that isolation is the enemy of excellence, mm-hmm. right? Uh, a lot of men really take a lot of pride in this lone wolf. Like I can be the lone wolf, but what, what a lot of us don't know is the lone wolf has dies by itself without yeah. the pack. Wolves how, run packs. Yeah, yeah. Right. Wolves run in packs. That's where the strength comes from. It's one of the most devastating myths of our time right there. It is. Yeah. How has, how has like-minded men helped you with this, with this point in your book that you talk about getting connected? Um, man, let me back out for a second and then I'll drill down into that answer. Here's what we have to realize. And I I thought this was going to be earth shattering news in 2019 when the study was released and it came out of the journal of American medical association. I thought it was going to be the thing that rattled our culture out of its slumber. And then of course, 2020 hit and then, then, then world war three is how you're right. So now we're, now we're over here, but um, the journal of American medical association came out in November, I believe it was in November. And they, here was their astounding finding that for the third year in a row, the average lifespan of a U.S. citizen went down for the third year in a row. We, the most, we dump more money into healthcare. We've got more systems, more technology, fMRIs and biologists and all the stuff, all the research institutions, everything. And we're still dying younger. And what they came, the conclusion they came to was it's not murder and it's not people, you know, what fill in the blank with whatever comes on, whatever news station you watch. It was three things. They called them diseases of despair. It was suicide, addiction, and organ disease failures, like heart disease and liver disease, which can be either from addictive behaviors or their long tail, the ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences, the things that happened to us as kids, they end up paying off in our 50s and 60s with elevated risk for stroke and cancer and heart attacks. Bodies that just quit. They've been fighting and fleeing for so long, they're just out of gas. They quit on us. And if you drill down in the statistics, it's diseases of despair. Another way to say that is long tail suicide. Another way to say that is we are lonelying ourselves to death. And then you put that on top of some of the research at the University of Chicago with um, Johnny C and a whole crew of, you know, loneliness is more devastating to our bodies than smoking. It is killing us. This isn't a game. This isn't like, yeah, bro, you need a game. I'm telling you, if you are alone, if your body recognizes, I got nobody, or I got two friends, and one of them was my buddy from high school 30 years ago, and another friend is like from college. He was like my bro, but we we talk every four years. Your body is eating itself from the inside out. It's killing you, and it is reverberating through those who love you. They are paying a price too, and I hope that I say as clear as I can. So for me, I found myself surrounded by people who loved me. I shared a bed with somebody who said she loved me, and I was completely and totally alone. I had close friends that I've known for years. Loneliness for me wasn't about human beings. It was a state of mind. It was this idea that I'm all by myself. 
and that I, it, I've i made up these stories that are running through my head, they're running through my body, and my life is about what I can solve. And man, I ran to the edge of the cliff and flew off of it, man. I was just completely and totally alone. And so healing for me was walking backwards, and it started with getting connected to other people. I had one guy that I lifted weights with. I didn't even realize what I was doing. I thought I was working out. No, what I was doing was having conversations with a great, great man who was an attorney, who was brilliant and who was kind and who listened to me run my mouth. And he showed up every day. And then he showed up again and he showed up again. And then him and I and another man had lunch every single Tuesday to talk about heavy, crazy things. And then I had another group of guys with that got together every Monday morning for breakfast. And so these things, I, they weren't the therapy I was going to. They weren't in some fancy book. I, these gentlemen, these men laid the foundation for what would become the home of healing that I would build later. And none of it, it would have been on sand and mud and water if I had tried to build it any other way. When you talk about that, that lunch that you have on Tuesdays, it sounds like that was just a no hold bar and like pretty, pretty raw. It, it allowed for raw conversations. Here's what's beautiful. So the guy, one of the, the, the third guy there, who one of the guys I credit with, with really saved my life. He, uh, He's a monk and he's also a professor and he sat down at the table and here's the words he said, and I don't recommend everybody say this, but it was the first time in my life I'd felt safe. He said, and I quote, just so everybody's clear at this table, I will go to jail with what's said at this table. And that was it. And we all kind of hung there and I was like, okay. And I didn't really know what I was getting into, but the idea that I could speak freely and I could say, this is troubling me and this is keeping me up at night. And the idea that he said, I will hold what is said at this table absolutely sacred. I won't tell my wife. I won't tell my kids. I won't tell anybody. I won't gossip about it. That's the first time in my life I'd ever been able to go, oh, okay, I'm not okay. Right. And to say it out loud and let those words come out. And then we go back to the shame part. Now the healing can begin because I'm not holding secrets in my body. And I'm not. I'm not making my body go to war over the stories that are on loop in my head um, every single day. And so, yeah, there was something sacred about that time. And then, yeah, then it's iron sharpens iron. Well, I think this is happening. Well, I think that's stupid. I think it's this. And so you got, you know, the lawyer was a Harvard lawyer and he's a savant professor in biomedical ethics. And you had my knucklehead butt just sitting there. So, yeah, you got three guys who are telling the truth and are pretty smart and figuring life out together. And I also have a buddy who works, who sells oil products and, an, and another buddy who runs the CEO of a grass cutting company. And we have similar conversations. So it's not about education or anything, but it's about, can you show up and be safe here? Can you tell the truth? Can you be honest? And people are going to love you. They're going to challenge you. They're going to push on you, call you dumb, whatever. But do they love you? And are they going to hear you? And they're going to keep what you say safe. Most of us have had to outsource that to a therapist now who has a code right. of conduct that they have to outsource. And that's such a shame. What a shame that we live in a world where we gossip and talk crap about each other and we can't hold secrets, but that's the world we're in. What a blessing, man. Uh, you mentioned iron sharpens iron. That's actually what my shirt says. So. Oh, <laughs> very cool, man. Yeah. <laughs> big believer in that big believer in that. I, here's, here's how big of a deal it is to me. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a senior leader at my dream college. I'm working at a billion dollar university here in Nashville. You work your entire career for this job. And I got it about a decade early. So my life was set. It comes with tuition for my kids. I mean, it's really my life set. And then I run into Dave Ramsey and my whole life takes a left turn. In one of our interviews, I'm sitting with Dave, who's a, you know, he's a, a real famous guy. He's a super generous guy, all this stuff. And one of the last questions I asked Dave was, who keeps you accountable? Who do you listen to? Because you have a big business with a thousand employees. You're like number two guy listened to on the planet. Like, who do you listen to? Because here's what I knew. I've researched those who, quote unquote, made it. That was my part of my academic training. I've sat with people in the middle of the night who've lost a loved one or a child, who've lost everything. I've sat with the folks who, quote unquote, have made it. And they were completely and totally alone. And I asked, so I'm not going to come work for a CEO that is untethered, that has nobody, except his power and his own ego. And so I asked Dave, who keeps you accountable? Who do you listen to? And wouldn't you know it, man, he's like, well, I've got my Eagles group, my group of 12 men that I've met with for 14 years. I've got a group of pastors that I meet with once a month. I've got a, group, a dinner group that comes over to my house that we push on each other and we can we go back and forth. And I remember going out to the parking lot and I called my wife and said, 
Dave and I don't agree on everything. In fact, there's a lot we don't agree on, but I can work for this guy because he's got people in his life because he's a person of integrity and I trust him because he's got, he listens to folks and he's wise. And that was the, that was me taking a leap, leaving everything I knew to come do this wild job. But it was based on, that's how, that's how sacred I hold. Do you have people in your life? That is beautiful. You know, when I think of, which by the way, we probably know a few of those Eagles together, Aaron Walker is a mentor mm-hmm. of mine. I don't know if you know, big a, uh, uh-uh, no, oh, you don't. He's, he's been in the, that Eagle group for a while. Um, Dan, uh, Miller, Dan, Dan Miller too. Um, but, uh, here's the, here's the interesting thing. I had Navy seals on this podcast and you, just, you mentioned Dave Ramsey and it's the exact same theme. You know, you get like somebody who's a special operator, right? Who's a Navy SEAL. And, and you ask them like, hey, how, how is it that you've been so successful? And they'll say, oh, it's because of the team. I got a team. That's yeah, exactly right. Team. And he's like, and not only if I'm pinned down under gunfire in battle, will I call on my team? But in life, when I'm pinned down under life's gunfire and in battle, I have to call on my team. I have to ask for help. I have to go to my board of advisors for help and, and strategy. And if those people, you know, if Dave Ramsey can do it, if you can do it, if special operators can do it, why can't the everyday man? Because I would flip that around and say, if the people who have quote unquote, everything, the highly trained, the super wealthy, the super accomplished, just look at how they're living their life and say, what are the, what are the ingredients to their life? Every one of them is going to tell you, I've got a community. Mm -hmm. I've got people that I can go to. Um, and I, it, it, speaking of the military, I think one of the most devastating, I mean, you look at the mental health statistics of folks who come home, we, there is clearly trauma, clearly PTSD, clearly stuff they experience. I'm of the firm belief that a lot of trauma, a lot of PTSD is cured and healed through community. And you take somebody who is plugged in at a level that most of us will never understand. And you completely unplug them from all of their safety networks, those people that they've done battle with, that they've held while they were dying, those people that they have loved deeply and trained with. Then you just drop them into their job at Costco. You're like, all right, go get them. That's a brain that's going to scream and scream and scream to be plugged back into that level of connection and safety and community. And they don't have it. And so you're hearing folks now say, hey, you got to find a new gang. You got to find a new group. You got to find a new mission that you get on with other people. Cause that's where the path to healing is, is connection. I totally agree with that, man. I used to, you know, years and years ago, I used to lone wolf it and uh, learned several years ago. That's, that's not the way. Yeah. Um, I want to get to this other point that you talk about, which I think is probably one of the most difficult things to do. And that is changing our thoughts. Like I think the majority of us believe number one, I am my thoughts. You know, and number two, I can't change my, I, I can't change my story. I can't change my thoughts. Those are my thoughts. So my thoughts are my reality. Mm. And I don't, it, it, as, as far as your book goes, I, I don't know if you agree with that statement, that that might be one of the hardest things to do, but um, how do we go about doing that in like the simplest form? I love that question. Yeah. I just got some data back from some early readers and that chapter on changing your thoughts has become the that I didn't expect this. I thought one or two of the other chapters were going to be the go-to chapters. That's the one that's, that is continuing to pop up as the most revelatory, the most, um, one of the strongest takeaways. Um, most of us never, it never occurs to us that that voice that is constantly going, the one that says it's hot, it's cold outside. I'm so bored. I can't believe that guy said that. Do I look good in this? Did that guy just look at me weird? Is, how did my, how did my butt look in this pants? I mean, how did, all those things that it's just on loop. It never stops. Yeah. We don't ever stop and go, who is that? Who's talking? (laughs) Because if it was a friend, we'd punch him in the mouth. Like we just say, shut up, stop speaking. And so most of us, 99% of us go through the day just with that voice on loop. And where that's dangerous is we just assume it's us. And there's a lot of research that suggests that we're generally one of the few people that we trust because we think that we're above average at just about everything. We think we're above average drivers and above average smart, above average at our jobs. And we're just above average, good looking. And we just pretty much think that we're okay. And so with that voice is going, we trust that voice. And usually that voice is one of two things. It is the stories we were born into and the stories we were told become the stories we tell ourselves. And that's where that thing's evil, man. That mom who told you, hey, 
yeah, you don't wear that shirt. You're pudgy and you want boys to like you, right? Or that one that said, hey, get up. That didn't hurt. And you're thinking as a little boy, I think it hurt. Yeah. But sure. I trust I trust him because he's bigger than me and he's smarter than me. So I guess I'm crazy. And so I can't trust my own body. That turns into, I'm not going to apply for that job. I can't get that job. They would never hire a guy like me. Or, dude, she would never go out with me. Or, of course, I suck at being a dad, right? That's that. It turns into that story, and we believe it. And it goes on and on and on and on. So, number one, we don't even challenge it. The second thing is, we don't have any tools in our cultural lexicon on how to push back on that, how to stop, right? There's some really extraordinary research. Ethan Cross just wrote a, it was a, it's a book I recommend everybody get. It's called Chatter. Um, it's a quicker book to read. He's at the University of Michigan. It's phenomenal. And all he does, he studies the voice that's on loop in our heads. And he tells some really remarkable stuff. Here's one of the big takeaways of that book. If you speak in words like I and we and us, it activates your fight or flight system. When I think I need to, I should have, oh, we're going to, your body spins up as though, okay, we're in it now. We're going. And we have no, once the, once the fight or flight chemicals hit, spin into our bodies, man, what do we do? We used to go fight something or sprint away from it. We had a natural process to cycle these things out. Now we just go, <gasps> we send a mean email response, right? We don't do anything. We don't go anywhere. We get in our cars and drive for 30 minutes home. And we get home and we're angry because that stuff's still sitting in us. But here is fascinating. Have you ever had a problem with your wife? And you're like, I don't know who I married. She's insane. And she's thinking, you're she nuts. Said, she says that more about me. probably. Exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? But then somebody comes and says, hey, man, will you help me? I, I, me and my wife are struggling. And you have answer one, answer two, answer three. Whenever we have thoughts about them and you and others, it doesn't activate our fight or flight system. It doesn't disconnect our frontal lobe and say, run or fight. It allows us to stay engaged and critically think through those answers. And so it's, there's a process for how do I keep my brain engaged when I'm having these thoughts? How do I begin to control these thoughts? So here's the exercise. This is from the master, from David Kessler, the grief expert. Here's what he has. His, um, he, he, he talks about uh, doing this with parents who've the worst. They've lost a child. And they can't get the picture out of their head of their kid in the, right after the accident or on the gurney or at the funeral home. They, that picture just keeps lightning bolt into their head and they can't get it out, can't get it out. So here's what he has them do. He has them close their eyes, just close your eyes. And so if you're listening to podcasts, just close your eyes for a second and just picture a purple, purple elephant in your front yard. Wherever your front yard is, just picture a purple elephant. Now picture a little yellow hat on top of that purple elephant, just sitting there, not doing anything. And now you can open your eyes. And what he tells the parents is, you just proved it to yourself. You can control your thoughts. You can put pictures in your mind whenever you want to. And now it's up to you. Now, this is where it gets hard. We can't control the lightning bolts, the ones that pop into our head when we see our wife left her shoes on the floor and we're like, why does she hate me? Right. I can't control that. One. That one just shoots it. Right. Or did that guy just look at my body again? Like, like that just shoots into your head. And from that point forward, I have a choice. Am I going to meditate on that? Am I going to go down that rabbit hole? Am I going to end up in a pile of ash and resentment and anger and frustration? Or am I going to replace that with a different thought? And so instead of picturing when that picture flashes in my head of that child at, at the funeral home, I can either meditate on it, I can think about it, I can start weeping, I can let my body take off on me, or I can go, nope, and I can insert a picture of my child on a big wheel laughing as though hell, laughing so hard. Um, I can, when that picture of the abuser pops into your head, I can go, nope, not doing that. And I can think about my dad who loved me, who gave me a hug, who laughed with me, right? I get to pick what I do. And if I will practice that over time, those thoughts in our head are just our body trying to keep us safe. Just trying to keep us safe. And it remembers the story. It remembers the story. I want to keep you safe. So I'm going to remind you of this. I want this to never happen again. And we have to bring ourselves and say, you know what? I'm going to let that story go. It kept me safe for a season. And now I'm in a different season and I'm okay. Now I'm in a relationship where I'm safe. Now I'm in a room where there's air conditioning. I'm okay. I got food now. I didn't have food then. I got food now. I'm going to insert this thought. And over time, our default setting will actually shift in our mind. So for me, dude, I used to get all raged out when people were driving like bonkers. And I just decided, um, I, I don't know what's going on in that person's head. And I'm going to quit spinning energy trying to get in their head. And so every time somebody cuts me off, I just whisper a quick prayer. I hope you're all right, brother. And I hope 
that you're getting to the hospital safe. I hope you're getting where, okay, because I don't know where you're headed. And I get to choose. Did he cut me off because he's trying to kill us all? Or he's just one of them dumb kids on the TikToks and on the, on the, on the cocaines? Or do I get to pick in my head, man, that dude's going to say goodbye to his dad before his dad passes away. And he's, he's, he's hauling down the highway to get there. I get to pick one of those, whichever one of those stories I choose. And I'm going to begin to train my head over time and it will go where we train. Uh, I think it's, again, I think it's Dr. Brown that says, you, whatever you go looking for in the world, you will surely find. And so I'm going to begin to shift what I'm looking at, shift what I'm thinking about. And dude, I'll be walking through my living room and my, I'll just, <laughs> my wife cracks up. I'll just be walking through and I'll, she'll just hear me go, nope, nope. And she's, <laughs> she used to think I was going mad, but now she knows. I started down a track and I'm just going to stop myself. I'm just going to quit. And I'm going to think about something. I did it this morning. I popped up at 2 a.m. I'm going to New York tonight. New York freaks me out. I, I got a, I got a bad history in New York. I don't want to, um, but I woke up at 2 a.m., 3 a.m. And I started down the rabbit hole. Remember that time? And I, I literally was in bed and I go, nope. nope. And uh, I went to something else, right? So I'm going to be active about taking back control of my mind. Sometimes that's writing stuff down. Sometimes that is talking with a counselor or a friend. Hey, do I suck at being a dad? Because I keep having that pop up in my head over and over and over. Am I terrible? Do I just not know what I'm doing? Am I terrible at this? I'm going to get some feedback from some men in my life that I trust. I'm going to get some feedback from a professional. I'm going to write these things down. I'm going to examine these stories. But I'm going to be intentional about taking back control of my mind. And I'm living, walking, and talking proof that, it's, that it can happen. Um, it it's absolutely is, is a skill you practice. And it's a muscle that you flex. And over time, you get stronger and stronger and stronger. Wow. I'll tell you what, man, I, this is, we're, we're inching upon almost 900 episodes of, of dad edge. And I have never heard a guest go this far down the rabbit hole of how we can flip the script in our mind. Mm -hmm. And you did it in such a sim simple way as, as you're describing everything. I'm like, man, I wish I would have known that yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> hey, me too, man. I, yeah. <laughs> me too. I would have loved to have about 20 years of my life back. Um, I would live a lot longer. I assure you. Oh, that, this, this has been phenomenal. If you have time, I have one more question for you. Dude, I, I got all the time in the world. Awesome. I, and this one is, uh, it, it's really not so much probably about your book. Uh -huh. Um, you know, I, what I've noticed is, is the men in our audience, what they truly love more than anything is to really get to know the person, you know, behind the, behind the book and, and the brand and that kind of thing. And yeah. I know, I know you're married. I know you have a son, you have a daughter. Um, the question that I have for you is, if, how old are you right now? 44. 44. Okay. So let's fast forward to your 64 and let's fast forward. To, and you <laughs> that see guy's that guy's probably dead. He's probably <laughs> dead. <laughs> he hasn't made good choices for me. <laughs> <laughs> as long, if you're talking to yourself more at 64, we, we might have to have another discussion, but that's right. That's right. Um, you have a 12 year old, you said? Yeah. Okay. So 30, that is your son, correct? Mm -hmm. It'll be 32. Daughter is six, you said? So she'll be 26 and your wife, you guys will be married for an additional 20 years. I want you to just think for a moment that you're sitting at dinner with your, with your wife, your son and your daughter. And perhaps at that point in time, your family has expanded and you've got grandkids, uh, but everybody's sitting at dinner and you're just admiring, acknowledging and appreciating just the family and the people that you're surrounded by. And I just want you to think for a second that you hold up your glass, you look at your wife, look at your, look at your son, your daughter, and perhaps the extended family and say, what has been some of the most meaningful memories and connections that we've made over the past 20 years that have meant the most to you? What are they telling you? Um, man. So I got home the other night, so we can have a whole other podcast about parenting and the digital world. Um, I'm, uh, my wife tells me I was born in the wrong century. So I'm, I'm pretty pathological about no screens and um, especially no phones. We watch movies in the house, but no phones or anything like that with my kids. And so I had this realization that my son brought it up. He's like, dad, you've, I'm, I'm that guy at school now. So thanks. I'm the weird kid that doesn't have <laughs> play Fortnite or whatever. And because my dad's lame and, but I got no, I got like, so what else? Like, can we, have some things here at the house that we can like have fun with. And that was a great call out on his part. So I bought a air hockey table and a foosball table. Nice. And here's the gesture. 
man, I can take my kids. We've taken them to the beach. We've done all this fun stuff. We've done silly stuff here and this, and I can bring home candy from work. And we go to big elaborate dinners and all that. The other night I got home uh, from work late at a late media night. I got home and um, I'm, I'm pretty pathological about sleep too. And so the house goes to bed pretty early. Our whole family is. And I got home and it was about 8.30, which for my kids is basically midnight, right? <laughs> and I thought my daughter's light was on. And again, she's six. And I went down the hallway and I stuck my head in and she was just in there reading a book and she's learning how to read now. So she's practicing all by herself. I said, are you, baby, are you still awake? And she said, she just looked at me. I saw she put the book down. And I said, if you want to get demolished, I challenge you right now to a game of air hockey. And she looked at me and furrowed her brow. And she's like, you're dead. And she <laughs> hopped up in her pajamas. And I ran to the edge of the bed. And she jumped on my back. And I carried her downstairs to the basement. And we played a few rounds at air hockey. And we were talking trash. And I learned about something that had happened at school that I wouldn't have known about. And she thought she was, she, I think I snuck one of the Girl Scout cookies out, those crack dealers in my neighborhood who sell me Girl Scout cookies. And she thought that she had, I mean, that this whole world had opened up to her. Those are the moments, the moments when my son and I are crawling on all fours, trying to stalk some poor deer in the middle of some field. And we're laughing so hard because he just stepped on a stick and it made a big noise, but we haven't been spotted yet. It's the little things. It's the hug after hug every morning. It's my son making jokes at me at my expense in the morning when I come downstairs in my underwear. And he's like, wow, dad, that's what I want to see when I'm having breakfast. Right. And he's in sixth grade. So it's it's the laughter. It's the little moments. It's the boundaries and then the breaking of the boundaries for fun stuff. It's the. Hey, can we just have ice cream for dinner this one night? And they know how crazy I am about nutrition. And it's those moments when um, I held my son when he had a hurt and he wept. When my daughter lost a friend and just holding her until she can't breathe. She's crying so hard. Um, those are the moments, man. That's the cheers. It's the little stuff. It's not the big grand gestures. They're going to forget the fishing trips. They're going to forget the trips overseas. They'll see it. They'll remember the pictures. They're going to remember the nights that we snuck out of bed and went and played air hockey that we threw water balloons at each other on the last day of school. And that time that my wife, you know, dumped spaghetti on my head just to be funny. Like they're going to remember that. Um, and those are the moments that are sacred, and holy in my house. Man, we try to out, we try to out dad ourselves. Can I say that? We That's... try to out, we try to out dad ourselves. We try to out, we're like got some invisible scorecard that we're keeping with ourselves. We're our only contestant and we keep trying to beat ourselves. It's like, man, you know what kids want? They want a hug and they want like a water gun. And they want to a stick and some mud and they want to see you fall down. They want to see you shoot at a deer and miss and hit it. They want to go fishing and they want to learn how to tie a knot. And they want to hear you let them talk trash to you and you laugh back. I mean, they want to see you as a person. Mm -hmm. Here's one more. I took my son in yesterday. Or, no, it was yesterday. It was like three days ago, three days ago, right when the Ukraine thing set off. And I'll tell you what, I haven't wept that hard in a long time. It just got me in a weird way and I broke down. And again, I, I work with military folks too. I, I worked in crisis my whole career. For some reason, this one just got me. It got me. And I asked my son, he's 12, and I didn't want him getting this information from somebody else. And so we talked about what he'd seen, what he'd heard, and he knew way more than I'd thought. And I told him, hey, I just need you to know that daddy cried. It was hard. And I wept. The thought of putting you and mom and Josephine in a car and sending y'all away while me and the neighbors defend our home. Like it has got me because there's people over the, overseas right now doing that. Like he's going to remember that conversation because it yeah. wasn't a one and done. It wasn't this big blow up. It was daddy saying, Hey, dad's hurting. And this is what that looks like. It's just daddy being vulnerable. And um, I think those are the holy moments he's going to remember. Man, I love that. I, uh, I feel like I've said that a lot during this show, but I, <laughs> I, I truly have, you know, a few things there. If you've ever gentlemen, listen, if you've ever listened to any podcast that we've done here, and if you've ever been ever, so motivated to remove the device out of your evening. That's it right there. You know, it's, it's sharing the time playing air hockey, you know, it's, it's the foosball it's, and it's even the vulnerable moments, you know, that, that our kids get to see us as, as human beings, you know, as, as flawed human beings, it's, it's truly amazing. 
I know I said I have no more questions, but the last one, even though I'm older than you, my last question is, are you adopting? I don't eat a lot. So, and I, you know, I can, you know, just hang out. I'll take you. Mind. I'll take you. <laughs> you got to deal with the chickens. You'll have to fight my son for who's got to go get the eggs every morning. But yeah, there you go. come there on you in, go. brother. <laughs> hey, man, uh, I screw up. I screw, you know that. I screw yeah. up a lot, man. Good. God almighty, I screw up a lot. So we're, fi- we're all of us are figuring out and stumbling through every day. Uh, it's, it's forgiving yourself and being gracious with yourself and getting up and going again. That's true, man. And join the club. Uh, it's the biggest reason I started this podcast, still do the podcast is because I'm the host, but man, I, I get to have a front row seat to this most amazing education, uh, lear- learning from guests such as yourself. And this has been awesome. I want to make sure that the, uh, the men can find your book. And by the way, um, we have 700 plus guys in our data edge mastermind community. And on, I, I ran a, a group call this morning and I shared, with the guys, this amazing deck of cards called questions for humans. <laughs> and I was like, guys, the, these things are gold. And we actually picked one out and I had the guys text their wife, this question. And I said, if you, it, and it was, it was around the, if we could learn a new activity together, what would it be? And all these Hey-o. guys, there, there was 30 <laughs> plus guys on the call. And I was like, I want everyone to text your wife that right now. So one guy goes, thanks. He's like, awesome, man. Uh, next week we start salsa lessons. <laughs> Sweet. <laughs> it was so cool, man. It was There's so a cool. lot of love on the back end of salsa lessons. Well done. It's That's good. right. That's right. I want to make sure the guys can find everything that you're doing. If they want to connect with you, grab your book and all your other resources. So where can they find you? Man, I appreciate that. You can find me at johndeloney.com. Uh, D-E-L-O-N-Y. And you can follow me on the internets, on social media at John Deloney too. And the book's being at, on, in pre-sale right now. And um, one cool thing, I've got a partnership with BetterHelp and they've been a show sponsor and mm. supporter, but they stepped up in a pretty unique way. Um, they believe in the book so much. And I'm so grateful. They offer, they're offering a free month of therapy for people who pre-sell the book. My big fear is people are going to read it and close it and say, um, now not everybody who closed the book is going to think, Oh, I got to go see a therapist. But those who do, I didn't want them to go. Today's the day I make that call. And then they get put on a six month wait list. And then better help stepped up and said, we'll see somebody within 24 hours. And so they're offering a free month for the pre-sale. Um, and it comes with the audio book. So you can do that now at John It's like 20 bucks. And, um, the feedback has just been something else. I've something that's, it's really humbling. It's hard to read sometimes at how gracious people are being with, with what they're writing about the book. So um, johndeloney.com and they can get all that stuff there, man. Get the cards there and get everything. That is amazing. Well, guys, not, not to worry. Uh, by the way, you can spell Deloney D E L O N Y just in case you guys want to know, but not to worry. We'll have all the links in the show notes. All you guys will have to do is head on over to the dot edge.com forward slash three, six, six for this show. Again, the dot edge.com forward slash three, six, six. Dr. John, this has been an absolute pleasure. I feel like we just scratched the surface. I got to talk to you for hours, but this has been awesome to say the least. Thank you, brother Larry. I'm grateful for you, man. I really appreciate you putting good stuff out into the world and let's do it again. Back at you, my friend. Gentlemen, go out, live legendary. Take care.